Um, in six minutes time, uh, Dr. Cook is going to um, uh, begin his presentation. Now, uh, I um, I don't know him personally. I, I truthfully haven't uh, spoken to him yet, but we will be speaking, I'm sure. Um, so I think it's best that I do the introduction based on uh, what John Anderson had to say, because uh, John knows him, knows more about his work. I do know we are very lucky to have him here. I am grateful to have him here. Um, he is not just a, a, a musky uh, biologist. His research um, has been done around the world, is known around the world. He's pulled in all directions. So the fact that he uh, took time to come to here to speak to us uh, is, a, is a blessing and uh, I'm very grateful for it. And uh, um, there are a few people out there who can give us more information, tell us more um, uh, about um, where muskie research is going and what needs to be done, then he can. So um, before we get him on here, I'm just going to read a little thing. This is from John Anderson, and, uh, and here we go. Uh, Dr. Cook is one of the most well-respected fisheries scientists in his field, a prominent conservation science scholar, and a beloved mentor to dozens of students and early career researchers. With specializations in, among other things, fish telemetry and movement ecology, conservation physiology, um, a field he helped define, and interdisciplinary science, Dr. Cook is an extremely well-cited author whose research transcends traditional science disciplines. Dr. Cook strives to make his research impactful by making it relevant to a variety of groups, including anglers and policymakers. His accolades are too numerous to list here, but two notable awards include his induction as a fellow of the American Fisheries Society and a fellow of the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. Above all else, Dr. Cook is a true family man and greatly enjoys fishing and with his three young boys. Although he is a, a dyed in the wool bass angler, there is still time for us to convert him to Team Muskie. Um, so I would like to think he is, uh, available and without further ado, I'd like to pass the floor off to, uh, Dr. Cook. Thank you. It's to you, Dr. Cook. Are you Great. There? Can you hear me? All right. I can hear you. I hope everyone else in the world can. Excellent. Excellent. And I can now see myself on the screen over there. And at some point we'll need to do the, I've got my screen share up. So at some point we'll need to, I assume Lisa's got the magic for bringing that over. Um, excellent, excellent. So let's start off with a huge thanks. Wow, um, you know, this is an honor for me. Uh, you know, I, I like to think that, uh, that I, I serve you, that I, I serve society. Uh, although I work in a university, you know, much of our funding, much of our salary comes from the public purse. And, uh, you know, we, we try to work uh, with partners, uh, government partners, uh, industry partners, NGO partners uh, to make good things happen, to benefit our fish and fisheries and our fish populations. And so, uh, so I'd like to thank Danny and John of the Otto River Muskie factory, Lisa, uh, all the vendors who, who donated uh, various uh, lures and other goods uh, for the festivities, and of course, all of you who have uh, put your hard-earned uh, dollars forward and for, for your time, spending your time with us tonight. So, uh, so thanks a bunch. Um, I'll just note that I'm uh, a kickoff speaker this evening. There are more speakers coming at you over the next a uh, few days, so so please do uh, do check them out. So what I'm going to do tonight is talk about science to inform freshwater fisheries management and conservation. So I'm going to go a little bit broader than just musky. Uh, I need to do that for a few reasons. One, sometimes we use pike as models simply because they're plentiful. They're similar to musky, and I don't want to pretend that they they are musky, uh, but we can catch more than you know one in ten thousand casts. And so that from a, you know, otherwise it's pretty expensive for me to hire research assistants uh, for, the, for the summer to get, get much done. So you're gonna hear about pike, but you're also gonna hear about other freshwater fish. So I'm gonna pull upon uh, a variety of, of stories. 
Um, if you don't recognize uh, what's in the, the, um, the background in that photo, that is Carleton University. That is where uh, I'm, I'm fortunate to work. I haven't been there in, in quite a while, but uh, that is where I work. And that is the Rideau River. And there are, you know, I, I, <laughs> I'd bet my right arm that there is a muskellunge somewhere in the, in the foreground there. So uh, this is musky, musky territory. And so uh, when I had the opportunity to, to move from UBC uh, out in the West Coast to Carleton, the fact it was literally surrounded by water, that I could walk along the shore and see fish was amazing and a huge draw to me. So it's absolutely uh, um, phenomenal now that I get to work on these systems. So before we we dig in here, and I'm going to take you on a, a bit of a tour of some of the, the interesting things that I think we've been doing over the last few years, uh, I just want to stop and talk about partnerships for a minute. And uh, this is what I'm sharing on the screen here is from a symposium that we held at Carleton University, uh, done in collaboration with Muskies Canada, the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry in Carleton, uh, back uh, about uh, five or six years ago. And this is, uh, I, I think, really, when I think about specialized muskie anglers, and I think about all the good things that happen around muskie, it's because of partnerships. And what we're doing tonight is yet another example. This is a particularly creative example that we have tonight. Uh, you know, if we think about musk lunge science and management in the Midwest, which is where I assume most of you are based, although I think I saw in the chat there that there's somebody joining us from Scotland. Um, you know, these were fish that were once subject to overharvest and declines. And now we've got a highly specialized fishery where in most regions release rates uh, are, are, you know, darn close, if not exceeding 99%. And there's just not many other species uh, where that's the case. Uh, the anglers that engage in muskie fishing are also very engaged in science, education, conservation initiatives. Uh, when we publish a paper on muskie science, my email starts to ding because people are requesting them. I don't get that when I publish a trout paper. I don't get that when I publish a bass paper. Uh, but muskie anglers really like reading on about science and, and really becoming uh, engaged. And there's lots of examples of longstanding partnerships between, uh, between muskie anglers, between government, between uh, uh, academics and so on. And here's just but a few of those initiatives. There's the, the Angli, Angler Diary programs, various wetland habitat restoration programs. And I, I, I use the word umbrella effect. And, I, and the word umbrella uh, used in this context means that, you know, although many of you care a lot about muskie, everything you do for muskie benefits other fish. It benefits turtles. It benefits freshwater biodiversity. So even though you might be absolutely in love with muskie and that's why you're going into wetlands and, you know, planting uh, uh, native vegetation and planting trees and so on, uh, you are benefiting well be uh, fish and, and other organisms well beyond muskie. There's the Clytherum projects, the efforts put forward to educating non-specialist anglers, uh, and it goes on and on. And I think a great example tonight is funding research. So you are generating funds to support science. And to be clear, you are not supporting my salary. This does not go in my pocket. I'm paid by the province. Uh, this will support students. This will, will support hands-on science, training the next generation and generating musky science to uh, help with management and conservation. So why are the uh, why do we do these partnerships? Uh, and as I noted, this is you know when I think of partnerships, uh, I always highlight musky. I talked about par partnerships in fishery science in Australia a couple of years ago at the Australian Society of Fish Biologists, and about a third of my talk was about what we do with musky here in the Midwest. Okay, this is unique the world over. All right, just want to emphasize that. So we bring in multiple viewpoints into science and management. There's no single way to do anything. And the more voices, the more perspectives at the table, the better. This enables knowledge sharing. None of us claim to be experts. I might've spent more time reading books, but you spend more time in the water and we both have a lot to bring to the table. That ensures relevancy. If I just hang out and, you know, and, and read textbooks and hang out in the ivory tower, the science I'm gonna generate isn't gonna be very useful to the, the fisheries managers or the anglers. This gets cooperation and buy-in, okay? If we're generating science together, then you're more likely to 
to, um, to use it, to, to, to have buy-in. Uh, it, of course, generates funding and other resources to support science and management, promotes meaningful stewardship, and enables one to make something happen that would otherwise not be possible. So at the end of the day, even though I'm a scientist, I'm a biologist, I spent lots of time studying about fish and, and how fish work and how they interact with their environment. At the end of the day, conservation or sustainability is primarily not about biology, but about people and the choices they make. So here's a biologist telling you that it's about people. And I think that's something that we've really, really learned a lot over the, the last decade or so. Uh, recreational fisheries are a perfect example of what we call, to call a coupled social ecological system where we depend on fish and fishing, some of us for livelihoods, some of it for food, for leisure, um, and, and we impact uh, that environment that environment feeds back and, and impacts us. It's really a, an interconnected system. And when we think about the ways in which human behavior can matter, you can think about the various social movements such as refuse the straw or you know the, the movement towards uh, um, to, um, a dolphin friendly tuna uh, or science information or misinformation that we might see in the media. But, I'm not gonna to talk too much more about people tonight. I'm gonna to talk about fish. I'm gonna talk about things that I think would be of interest to you as musky anglers and musky advocates. So let's start off with this question. What does science tell us about catching fish? Okay, is there anything that, that we can learn from the science? Well, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this paper, uh, musky lunacy, and then it asks the question, does the lunar cycle influence angler catch of muscalunge? So if you read the abstract for this paper, it says there's an effect, and there is. You know, there's a statistical effect where anglers fishing exclusively on peak lunar days catch more musky than anglers fishing on random days. But what matters is the effect size. That's how big of a difference it is. The difference is 5%. OK, um, I'm I, I like to try and put things, you know, you know, when I can in my favor, if I can sort of play the odds. But a five percent increase in your ability to, to hook up on a musky on a full or new moon is not really a big difference. So, frankly, if you've got time to get on the water, I wouldn't care whether it's a full new moon, a, a new moon, or, or no moon, uh, I would get out there and try my hand at catching a muskie. Um, one of the, the neatest studies that we've seen in the last few years has come out of Germany. And this is my friend and colleague, Dr. Dr. Robert Arlinghaus from Humboldt University. And he's a fishing nut. We've had him over here in Ontario a few times uh, fishing for pike and muskie. And that's a, a Baltic uh, pike you see in the background. If, you, if all of you lived in Europe, you would be avid Baltic pike anglers instead of muskie anglers, I would guess. Uh, and they've got a, a couple cool lakes where they do a lot of research where they, they study where the fish are using telemetry, they track the anglers, and they've done some experiments. In this one uh, experiment, they studied 3,000 hour plus hours of fishing effort and looked at where fish were caught and what were the factors that influenced success. And the biggest predictors of catch were season and the habitat. So there were certain habitats that were better than others, and there were certain seasons that were better than others. But nothing like lunar phase or even angler expertise jumped down as important. So if you're in the right place <laughs> at the right time, then that increases the likelihood of catching a large pike. And I would guess that that probably is the case for not just pike, but any fish. Um, one of my uh, ex-students, Robert Lennox, who's now in Norway, was really excited uh, about fishing. He was, he was super into science and super into fishing. And so he decided that he would review what we know about vulnerability to capture. So across all the science that's known, what does that tell us about, you know, about how to catch fish? And at the end of the day, there were two take home messages that, that, are, are, that came out of those 300 papers. And these are not earth shattering, okay? First of all, hunger, if a fish is hungry, increases the probability that a fish will be vulnerable to capture. Duh, okay, that's, that's not exactly earth shattering. And second here, that encounter is a necessary yet often insufficient ca uh, condition for capture. So if your lure never goes anywhere near a muskie, in a given evening, there's no way you're going to catch a muskie. 
If your lure goes near a muskie, then you have a chance to catch it. But just because it went near it doesn't mean you will. OK, so both, of, you know, any of you should be sitting there scratching your head saying, my God, we pay scientists to do this. This is not what we were expecting. We were expecting to, you know, to find that magic recipe, that that secret to catching fish. And we failed. That is what we learned. Um, we were able to, to create this fancy diagram, which shows all the ways theoretically that things like sensory physiology and life history and so on, metabolic rate should uh, should influence vulnerability to capture. But at the end of the day, it's really about being hungry and being in the same location where there's a, a lure or a bait to be, uh, to be attacked. All right, so I'm gonna switch now. That was a, a, a quick uh, round the world summary of what we know about catching fish with a bit of a, a, a musky slant to it. Um, but what does science tell us about releasing fish? And Let's start off with this study. This is where I developed my musky cred. Uh, over a couple days in Illinois, I landed about 50 musky. Um, unfortunately, the biggest one is pretty much what you see in that, in that photograph. So uh, I might have the numbers, but I certainly didn't have the size. So these were musky that were stocked in experimental ponds. And we wanted to know whether or not hook type when using live bait, so we were using uh, little toughies uh, uh, as minnows, um, and we used a, a bait holder hook and a circle hook. And so circle hooks are purported as being a hook type that, that has the potential to reduce deep hooking and mortality. So we did the study and what did we find? We found that in muskie, injury sel seldom occurred, you know, no matter whether you're using J hooks or circle hooks. Uh, we found that anatomical hooking location did not differ by hook type and none of the fish uh, in, either, in either hook type was hooked in the gullet or the eye. Ease of hook removal did not vary. Um, and so essentially there was, there was no mortality for juvenile muskie captured on either. There was a difference in hookup rate. So J hooks hooked up about 60% of the fish that hit. And we knew that because those were the only fish in the ponds. Well, we only got about a 34% hookup rate on circle hooks. What we don't know here's a great picture from Sean, is what about on adults? And Sean did a very little bit of work on circle hooks and fish of this size uh, here in the Rideau in Ottawa, and maybe he'll share it, but we never got around to doing a, a full-on study. It just was uh, uh, something that we, we never got around to doing. So maybe that's the next iteration of Project no Noble Beast. So you're gonna hear from, from Dr. Sean Landsman tomorrow. All right, something else we've done recently is ask about, uh, ch you know, what does it mean if we change up the hooks on lures? And so there's a typical, you know, treble hook, uh, treble hooks on the top, what you usually find on lures when you buy them from the store. And you can now buy hooks that are, these aren't just random hooks under your tackle box. These are hooks that are designed for, for replacing treble hooks. And they're, they're placed on that lure in the direction that makes sense uh, when when doing this kind of replacement. And we were also interested in barbed and barbless. So this is Alexandra Trahan uh, who did this work and she did it on smallmouth, largemouth and northern pike. So again, this isn't musky, but we'll pay attention in particular to northern pike. Uh, and so we'll look at hook removal as an endpoint here, uh, assuming that it's better for the fish if you can get them off the hooks more quickly. And what you can see here is that overall hook uh, hook removal times varied from, you know, literally a second to, to over 300 seconds. And hook type did have a significant effect for all species. Um, and you can see how things are ordered there. So first of all, no difference for musky, smallmouth, or largemouth. And what we saw was that it took longest to get the barbed treble hooks out. And then the next quickest after that would be the, uh, the barbless trebles, uh, then the barbed single, and the absolute easiest and fastest to get out, not surprisingly, were the single barbless. Okay, so something to think about, uh, particularly if you're getting a, a lot of injuries, if you're having a tough time getting fish, um, fish out, uh, if you don't have a good pair of end cutter uh, or cutting pliers, uh, this is certainly a, a, a useful approach. Something else we've been working on lately is deeply hooked fish. So that happens, right? You're fishing every once in a while, you have that fish that's really deeply hooked. And there's all sorts of tools and strategies 
uh, that are available to try and get those hooks out. And so here are some of them. And last summer, uh, working with my boys, my, my crack research team, all under the age of 11, we did a study, or at least we started a study. And so my kids caught smallmouth bass. My kids are really good at deep hooking bass, uh, being, being children uh, when fishing with, uh, with live baits or jigs. Uh, and uh, we stopped the study after we, we held these fish overnight. Uh, and for the fish that we removed the hook, we had only one of them survive. 17 of those fish died after we removed the hook. Whereas the fish that were hooked in the jaw or had the line cut all survived, okay? I don't like killing bass. I don't like killing musky. So we stopped the study. And I haven't done that before. I've never had to stop a study because what we were doing was so bad for the fish. So I think the title of this paper says it all. Hook disgorgers remove deep hooks but kill fish. A plea for cutting the line. So if you have a fish that is really deeply hooked, and I'm thinking about in the gullet, then I strongly encourage you to cut the line, you know, get as close to it as you can with, uh, with good cutters, but don't try and pull it out because right where that hook point is, looking into the mouth of that, that bass, and I think that's actually a large one bass, by the way, but it, it shows off what I'm trying to, to demonstrate with the hook location there, even though this, this was a smallmouth study. Um, right under there is the heart. So when you start, dorking around trying to get the hook out, you end up macerating the heart. And if, if I were to macerate your heart, you would bleed out. Same thing happens to the fish. All right, so sometimes fish do bleed. And a lot of folks have brought up this idea of, well, can pot be used? And I've seen this for a, a number of years. It's probably been around as an idea for a, a decade or two. Uh, John Anderson's been using it on the Ottawa River with some success on muskie. Uh, we decided to do a study with support from a, a bunch of different organizations to ask the question, does this work? Using a couple different beverages. You can see there we bought a soda stream. So we also carbonated lake water to see if that worked. Um, we used gill color as a proxy for blood loss. So we looked at gill color beforehand and then we compared it after. Um, in this case, to standardize things, we used Northern Pike because we needed literally hundreds of them. And we used end cutting pliers to remove a standardized amount of gill tissue. So to be clear, that is how we simulated an injury. And I recognize that is not always representative of the kinds of injuries that you may be dealing with. For example, in the gullet, um, what did we find? We found that, that POP didn't provide any benefit, but it also didn't provide any harm. One of the things that we did notice was that when you poured the POP over the fish, they did stop bleeding temporarily. And that's because the fish went into a massive bradycardia, which is a fancy word for their heart stops. And that's what happens when you pour an acidic substance over the gills of fish. They essentially hold their breath. And so you put the fish back in a white cooler and you wouldn't see any blood. And then after about 20 seconds, there'd be a puff of red, like you see here, where there's a, a puff of red in the water. And then after five or six seconds, there'd be another puff and then another puff. And so as that heart rate started to get going again, the bleeding started. So it gave the illusion, at least in Pike, that it stopped the bleeding. Um, could this still work? Absolutely. We did this study in, in one lake on one species of fish, and we did things in a, a very specific way. There are other ways to do them. So if you think it works, if this is something that you think it is benefiting your fish, go for it. But right now, the only science we have on it suggests that at least for pike in the context I described, that it does not work. All right. Um, there's more to talk about in terms of catch and release, and you may be familiar with Project Noble Beast that Sean Landsman did for his master's project uh, back, oh my gosh, coming up on a, a, a almost a decade ago. Um, Sean uh, now has his doctorate, and he's going to be talking about this tomorrow. Uh, Sean is also on the faculty at Carleton. We're very fortunate. So, uh, you know, uh, um, the introduction sort of, you know, praised me as a musky researcher. I'm a poser compared to Sean, and Sean and I will be doing lots of fun collaborations over the coming uh, decades as we work together. So, uh, so I look forward to uh, being a, a partner in crime with him moving forward. All right. Um, one of the things I, I want to introduce you to, if you're not familiar with it, is the keep fish wet movement. And this grew out of, you know, the cold water, you know, gentle trout angler. But I think it really applies to muskie as well. 
when we when we try and message to anglers what to do to improve outcomes from fish, it needs to be simple. And I really like the keep fish wet method uh, uh, message. And in fact, I'm one of their board board members. I believe so much in in this movement. Um, and there's three simple principles, and there's scientific basis to all of them. One is minimize air exposure. Two is reduce contact with dry surfaces. And three is to reduce handling so that you can get that fish back in the water and, and, and swimming away as quickly as possible. If you're gonna drill down to the most simple things that you can do to benefit a fish that you're going to release, these are the three things. And I think when we interact with more novice anglers, this is the kind of information that we wanna be sharing. All right. I'm going to transition now and I'm going to go pretty high level and start talking about the status of freshwater fish around the world. OK, and the, the title at the top says it all. And I want to be clear here. I'm somebody that I try not to be to be dramatic, but the fresh fresh world's freshwater fishes are forgotten. They're doing very, very poorly these days. Uh, the World Wildlife Fund with a bunch of partners, all the big NGOs released a report a couple months ago, and it was damning and extremely scary. And, you know, being in Canada, it's really easy to say that can't be happening here. We have so much water and I like to go fishing and I still catch lots of fish. Well, uh, in this recent Globe and Mail article uh, with a couple of colleagues, we wrote about this. And again, the title says it all. Freshwater fish populations are failing for and forgotten even in Canada. And I wrote about this recently in Big Jim McLaughlin's Just Fishing magazine. Um, and, and, you know, I want to be clear, you know, smallmouth bass doing just fine. Northern pike doing just fine. OK, it is uh, it's the fish that you may not know the names of, but fish that are extremely important in food webs, fish that are food for the fish that we love so much. And so what needs the, their attention? You know, fish need all of our, uh, uh, need our attention, uh, not just the game fish, because we are going to really start to see those, those impacts on game fish. And at the core here, it's about habitat. And so I'm gonna spend a fair amount of time on habitat, but I just wanna show you the state of affairs in Canada. So this came out of a class that I led this fall. I had grad students uh, summarize the state of freshwater biodiversity. So you can see there it's you know amphibians, reptiles, and so on, but we're gonna to go to the far right. So those are fish in Canada. And so you can see of the proportion, uh, um, uh, um, so this is all, all the freshwater fish in Canada. So we've got a number of them that are extinct, a few that are extirpated, which is a fancy word for meaning they don't occur here anymore. Endangered means they're really screwed. And then it kind of works backwards from there, threatened, less screwed, special concern. And eh, we're starting to worry about them, not at risk. So that's that sort of you know, middle purple color there. The darker purple is data deficient, meaning we don't know. And then not available is somewhere between data deficient and, you know, we couldn't find anything. So uh, more than half of the fish are in that category that I'm not happy with, where where their status is, is endangered, threatened, special concern, and so on. And that should be concern to all of us. So we can't pretend this is only happening on the other side of the world. What about mega fish? So musky are, are right on the edge of being a mega fish. I know around here, they're certainly a mega fish, but on a global basis, they aren't nearly as large as these examples that I've shown here. Uh, that's a freshwater stingray from the Mekong and a white sturgeon from British Columbia. And if you look at the state of freshwater megafauna over time, this is all, all calibrated back to 1970. So it's called the Living Planet Index. And so imagine in 1970, everything was pristine. Everything was amazing. OK, populations are down over 80 percent relative to those 1970 levels. OK, and I'm worried we're going to start to see the same thing with 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 fish like muscalunge, that next group of sort of, you know, almost mega fish. Uh, those those top predators are fish that occupy unique niches. So something that I'm, I'm certainly concerned about and I think should be concerning to you as well. So what are we doing about this? It's nice to sit around and complain and, and you know, and sort of sob about the state of affairs. Um, things are going in the wrong direction. You can see the current trajectory. It is heading down. Um, what we need to do is fix this. We need to bend the curve upwards. You've heard about bending the curve in terms of dealing with COVID. We're trying to do the same thing here, but instead of, of bending the curve downwards, the, we want to bend the biodiversity curve upwards and recover biodiversity. 
So how do we do that? I was part of a team led by the WWF that created an emergency recovery plan. And there's six things that we need to do. And one of them I really wanna focus on here for the last part of my talk, and it's called protect and restore critical habitats. And that's something I think that we can all be a part of and what we're here to talk about in many ways today. So why habitat? Well, habitat is the foundation for healthy and productive fish populations, okay? If it's crappy habitat, uh, maybe the fish will survive, but they won't reproduce. And that's not what we want. We want natural, self-sustaining populations that are well-managed, that are able to sustain themselves. And habitat is at the basis of that. And that's why we continue to study musky habitat use and try and figure out what they need, uh, what is optimal habitat for them, and what we can do to enhance or restore habitat. And so this is the kind of work we do to make that happen. So here's some of my team members out electrofishing on the Rideau River just downstream from Carleton. We implanted radio tags in Kirsten Pankhurst, who is a, uh, an undergrad student really into pike and muskie. He spent his summer on bike and skateboard tracking these fish uh, along a reach of the, Rideau, uh, of the Rideau River from Carleton all the way downstream to the Ottawa River. Uh, and here's the kind of data he generated. He did this year round, including in the winter, uh, and we tracked musky and pike. And so the, the, uh, the pike are in black. We tracked more pike than musky and the musky are in gray. And so you can kind of see where they were spread out over time. Uh, the 417 bridge, so downtown is, is at the top and at the bottom is hogs back. And so you can see a lot of fish sort of in that area uh, downstream from uh, and, and around Carleton near Bronson Bridge. And then where there's that elbow there, uh, that's right where it widens out before it makes the turn by Brewers Park. So a fair amount of number of fish hanging out there. So at the same time, there were a lot of discussions going on about, uh, you know, is there a lack of northern pike and musky spawning habitat? And so uh, that brought up more questions. So we, we tracked these animals during the reproductive period and identified not only when they spawn, but we identified some of those, those key spawning habitats. Um, but the reason we did this was to inform the Brewer Pond Restoration Project. So this is uh, used to be an old swimming hole. Uh, it was sort of abandoned in that sense and was sort of filled in. Uh, but before it was a swimming hole, this would have been an, uh, a, a more natural wetland type environment. So there was interest in naturalizing this. So a whole bunch of partners came together uh, to work towards increasing the connectivity. So these large culverts were put in to create an opportunity for fish and other organisms to move freely between the river and the ponds. And so uh, the pond is now connected. You can go check it out. You can walk around there. But we ended up collecting some video footage. So I'm just going to play the video footage. I think it's about two minutes, if I'm not mistaken. And you'll see some of the fish, including musky, uh, as well as other organisms that are now using this system. That in the foreground was, uh, and right there, that's a log perch. That is not a, uh, a musky, but there is a musky. That was not a juvenile musky. And so uh, under there, so this camera is positioned on top of the culvert. And so there's the musky checking out the culvert. And there is the log perch making a good decision and swimming the other way. There we've got a snapping turtle. <laughs> Big old snapping turtle. They can grow to be about 80 years of age. <laughs> Painted turtle. And everybody loves a beaver being, being Canadian. So yeah, so I'll, I'll oh, and a smallmouth bass chasing the beaver. So, uh, and there's another uh, two musky. <laughs> so cool. Again, right at the entrance of that uh, um, uh, of that that culvert. So, 
So I'm going to stop there. Uh, but that's an example of what we believe to be a, a success story. It's still early days after you restore habitat. It takes a while for it to, to naturalize for fish to figure out what it is and it's there. But certainly the fish community in there is changed. And now if fish end up there in the spring, which oftentimes happens in, in flood conditions, they have a way to get out and their babies have a way to get out. So we've improved connectivity. We also do work on juveniles. Some of that work was done in partnership with John Farrell and his team uh, down in, uh, in Syracuse working at the Thousand Islands Biological Station. And so there we did work on juvenile pike and muskie in the St. Lawrence River using really tiny tags. And those tags, uh, you can see in the picture there, I didn't provide anything for context, uh, but they are about the size of a, you know, a, a a big piece of rice, a big piece of basmati rice. So uh, they are they are tiny. These are tiny tags that last, you know, about about ninety days or so. The ones we were using here, um, and so we were looking at, in particular, fall and winter habitat use in various nursery bays. This is work done by Sarah Walton, who's who's in that image there for her masters. And so uh, here's just one of the bays, and so the fish was tagged in there all of the yellow pins, that's where we had receivers. And what we saw basically between September and November is the fish is sort of moving from the back to the front of the bay. And on occasion around November 5th, November 8th, spent uh, a couple days doing these sort of short forays into that deeper off, um, um, deeper area off in front of the bay, still, you know, about 20 feet deep, whereas uh, in the, the earlier period, September to early November, it was more three to four feet deep. And then they disappeared. They dropped off the array November 8th. And that was a pattern we saw pretty uniformly across the system. So where these fish use these habitats and then a mystery after that, there's still more work to be done. Um, and these were the kinds of maps that we were able to generate. So for October, November, and December, going across from left to right, and then we had three bays, Rose, Flynn, and Buck, and we were able to do this on, on both species, we're able to identify these areas of habitat use. And so that's useful for informing where we, where we try to restore habitat or where we try to enhance habitat. It, um, you know, where are they hanging out? Uh, where are they not hanging out? And what's different between that and, and the areas where they are hanging out? And how can we exploit that knowledge to enhance habitat? Jordana Bergman has been tagging juvenile and adult pike and muskie in the uh, echo lands reach of the Rideau Canal. She's been out there over the last few days tending her receivers and will be doing some tagging uh, very soon. I'm not gonna tell you any more about that because she is also speaking tomorrow. Um, but I, I thought I'd, I'd, as I wrap up here, end with this. You may not know, but it's actually the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration started this year this is a big deal, okay? 10 years, uh, everybody around the world trying to work together on this. And so I think this would be a really interesting opportunity for focus for some of the, the musky uh, clubs and organizations really trying to make a big splash in the coming years in this space. Uh, I don't want to pretend it's easy. In fact, I've written a paper where we criticize this concept that we have a long way to go to really realize the promise of a decade of ecosystem restoration. Ecosystem restoration is still in its early days and a lot of it is about guessing and we need better science to make sure that what we are doing and what we're calling restoration actually benefits uh, fish populations and fisheries. So there's a lot of, a lot of work to be done there. Um, what's fortunate for us is there's so many local restoration efforts where we can study this, where we can assess this. And again, this would not have happened if it wasn't for partnerships. So here's just a few examples. Um, there's one at Carleton University. It's that bay off to the right. So it looks, you know, uh, as you just uh, halfway downstream between the train bridge and the bottom right corner, there's a little bay there that was created uh, and enhanced. Uh, I know Muskies Canada was involved and others. Like I said, it was before my time in Ottawa, but we routinely capture uh, juvenile fish of all species in and around the, those habitats. Uh, in the bottom right is the Chapman Mills uh, habitat uh, uh, restoration work that was done there, creating opportunities for the public to engage through boardwalks and, and displays, but also creating some amazing musky, uh, musky habitat for reproduction. And then the bottom left is one of the most recent studies. And this is uh, studies, um, uh, restoration 
act actions. This is uh, work done by Jen Lamaru and the team at the Rideau Valley Conservation Authority. And she's been involved in all of these projects, actually. Uh, um, and here they're working on the Jock River. So creating some, uh, some embayments, uh, increasing potential spawning habitat, as well as nursery habitat for, uh, for early life stages. So we're so very fortunate to have this kind of work happening right here. And it's happening here because there's people that are asking for it, people demanding it, and people volunteering their time to make it happen. So keep up the good work. Uh, I feel confident in the future of muskie and freshwater fish, knowing we have engaged folks like you working on behalf of the fish and, and working together. So with that, I'm gonna wrap up. I really appreciate all of you. I really appreciate the organizers and I look forward to seeing you on the water. Comments there and I'll get to them afterwards. You're welcome to email me or ping me on, on Twitter and uh, or Facebook. Thanks so much. Dr. Cook, a uh, huge thank you on behalf of myself, uh, everybody involved with the symposium and uh, all the viewers. Um, I feel like you're a genuine uh, steward of our waterways. And uh, what I loved about your presentation, what I love to see is that you guys are actively out there doing things. It's, it's not just um, paperwork and things like that. You're every chance you can, your feet are wet, your hands are dirty and, uh, and work is getting done. So that's really encouraging when you're trying to uh, raise money. It's good to know that when you put it in somebody's uh, research pot, that it's going to translate into uh, a physical representation. Um, so thank you very kindly. Thank um, you. And we're incredibly grateful. I'm holding up a, a check from Danny. So grateful. This will get deposited at Carleton. I promise you that. <laughs> I need it out of my bank account sooner than later. <laughs> I'll make it happen. <laughs> You're a good man. Uh, I, there'll be a second check coming. Um, I'm going to iron out all those details. But uh, remember, that's not from me. That's strictly from the the people and the bait builders right. and uh, everyone so involved in the project. So well, there'll be more, and uh, and it's so awesome to see what you can do with it. So thank you so much. Thank you.